please. Okay, are we ready here? Yes, Everything is set up? Ready. We're ready to go? Yes, please. It's Monday night, and here we are with the continuation of the reading of malaria. My name is Odie Hawkins, and I'd like to say hi to Zola Selena Hawkins, over there behind the camera. Yes. And here we go. <clears throat> the story thus far is talking about an African-American guy who lives in a, a, a neighborhood in Accra, Ghana called Osu. And thus far I presented my case for malaria. And uh, now I'd like to explore a little deeply, a little more deeply into the neighborhood itself and how it was to live in a real regular lower I don't want to say lower middle class, it was not that, just a lower class Ghanaian neighborhood in Accra, Ghana, the capital city. I'm continuing where I left off. And here we go. These are people looking at me, I guess you could say, and I'm looking at them. And this is the way we saw each other. I think O'Day was the first Obruni to ever come into our place. And Obruni, in Moje's chop bar? Oh, we were very curious about him. Where did he come from? Sister Afua, the one who puts her ears into everybody's business, found out that he lived in Al Haji compound, just there behind the bar at the junction. He had built a small place for himself and his woman. I would have to say he made a good impression on us. He came often for his fufu and light soup with a couple boiled eggs sometimes. And he liked the beer. <laughs> Always ABC. Ah. Or a couple tosses of gin or brandy or sometimes he mixed it together like the local people. He was not a tourist. One could easily see that. And after he came here a few times, sometimes with his young wife, a Ghanaian, I felt at ease with him. Moje's chop bar was a typical lower class chop bar in Labadi. That's what they call it. They eating chop bars and then they're drinking chop bars. And food, of course, is chop. Okay. The concrete floor of the place slanted downward from the floor, downward from the door. The eight tables were covered by ancient strips of glued on plastic plaid tablecloths. The whirling fans overhead sounded like loose helicopter blades and the food was barely edible. <laughs> Sorry, Moje. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> One afternoon standing near the bar I had a chance to peek behind the curtain that screened the kitchen. Amidst pots of bubbling stews and food were being pounded, children were playing, a couple People were sleeping near the wall, a typical Ghanaian kitchen. The thing I liked most about Moje's was the lack of pretension. You went to Moje's when you couldn't go anywhere else, and for 500 CDs, you could get your belly full of poo poo. My sister Doris, who had been married to the Frenchman, brought him to see me at my church. He had been living in the Fair Gardens Hotel for four months and he was desperate to find a place to live. No one had ever lived in the Fair Gardens Hotel for so long and lived to speak of it. We prayed together even though he told me he was not a Christian. I believe he spoke of one of the, the, the new religions that some people practice in the U.S. I told him it was not important how he believed so long as he believed. Hallelujah! As we all know, Jesus is great, a unifying voice. I told him that I would speak to my congregation about his need. Perhaps that one of them could help him. After that time, he came to visit me a number of times, especially after he moved into the Grace Jones Hotel with his sweetheart. That was the real name of the place. The Grace Jones Hotel, mm -hmm. about 50 meters down the road from my church. 
I had no doubt that he was spiritually oriented because of the respect he gave me. Me and Pastor Betty used to <clears throat> greet each other. I don't know how this happened when we first met. But the first time we shook hands, she took my hand and kissed it. And I grabbed her hand and kissed it. And, you know, people, uh, she was a little lady. She reminded me a little bit of Tanina Shambo Bumi, about the same size. And mm -hmm. she was Pastor Betty. She had her own church mm -hmm. in Labadi. Mm -hmm. But the hand kissing was just stunning. Everybody, you know, well, what's that about? Mm -hmm. Just respect. Yeah. I must have stared at Pastor Betty for five minutes when I was first taken to meet her. She looked and acted so much like my friend and mentor, the late Iyalosha Tanino Shangobumi, that I was stunned. Same color, same size, same imperial attitude, different religion. Or was it a different religion? I made a careful study comparison of the scene. Pastor Betty was the charismatic head of a large organ congregation that would probably be, be labeled Pentecostal in U.S. terms. It was an African celebration of the spiritual side of life to the core, complete with drumming and procession. The Eulogia was a priest of Shango with the characteristic red, white color code and the other things that told us who she was. Pastor Betty was, is a priest of Yemaya, she would deny it. Of course, she would gently try to push my mind away from such wild ideas, but it would be difficult. Why is your church painted blue and white? Because those are pretty colors, don't you think? <clears throat> what about the barrel of sacred water at the side of the altar? What's that about? Water is always sacred because it's so precious. We couldn't live without water, not even in America. Pastor Betty, like the Eolosha, had great fun playing with my innocence. There were moments when I could see the sagacity of the Eolosha gleam at me from Pastor Betty's eyes. Or I could feel the warmth of her passion for life when I kissed her hand and she returned the kiss. I was drawn to her church. But I didn't feel at ease about becoming a member of her congregation. I was a closet worshiper. It was quite easy living 50 meters away to hear the staccato call of the drums, the gorgeous melodies of the songs. Oh man, they sang. Ooh. Uh, there was a large wooden louver window on the east side of the church where I could stand in the shadows and listen to the services. On one occasion, I was so moved by the devoutness of what I heard I stood in the open window and stared at the holy people inside. I stared into Pastor Betty's eyes, Iyalosha Tanina Shangobumi's face, for a long moment. There were no words to explain what passed between us. Why didn't I go inside the church, participate in worship? I was afraid. I was afraid my presence would alter the flavor of things. The simple fact that my presence would be acknowledged would change the vibe that I felt as an outsider in Obruni. There was no way to get around that. It was inevitable. Perhaps the Eolosha and Betty would be able to continue doing what they were once doing, but the children would stare at me. That was a certainty. And I couldn't sing the songs they were singing. And I definitely couldn't see myself seated amongst them in the mix, looking around like an anthropologist or a writer. I didn't feel that I would fit in, so I stayed out, which was a smart thing to do. It was all about spiritual matters anyway. And I didn't, it didn't really matter if my body was on this outside, my soul was all the way in. We all felt that. The feeling was like the one I had when I went to get a haircut from Mr. Hayes. Mr. Hayes was an incredibly crippled man who got around on his on his knees and and his elbows. You see a lot of these kinds of cripples in Ghana. I don't know what it's called. Some kind of some kind of uh, per, uh, some kind of polio. But he walked around on his hand. Oh, he walked around on his hands like that. 
Mr. Hayes looked and moved like the, a grotesque human spider, that he was not a very good barber. He was a hustler, a sharpie, a wheeler dealer. Had a couple of wives, eight or nine children, and was building a house for his father. Baba introduced me to Mr. Hayes, not so much for his barbering, but as a real character. He sat on a platform with his withered legs draped over the sides. The customer sat on a box between his ugly little legs, and he'd snip away, philosophizing all the way. He talked about the world as he saw it, and incredibly, his points of view had nothing to do with his crippled body. I was blown away when I thought about it. How could someone be so handicapped and not see that as a liability? He didn't recognize his wretched state. And that made him a magnet for those who wanted to look upon authentic greatness. Mr. Hayes had overcome everything. There was no more surprises for him in his life. Life had shown him what it was all about, survival. It took a little strength to sit between his legs for the haircut. And later the strength would grow as the customer started to think about the man who was cutting his hair, calling out to his neighbors, Disciplining his children. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. The man was cutting his hair, growling at his wives. <clears throat> That's the feeling it became for me in any case. He was a bit around the bend from Palm Wine Junction, but I always felt that he was thread in the fabric of that scene. We never saw Palm Wine to the Obruni before. He usually stopped for a, a tot when he and his woman came to watch the evening news at the repair shop just over there. That's how neighborhood it was. He went to the open air <laughs> thing to watch the TV in the evening because everybody didn't have a TV and nobody, nobody had a telephone except for people who came through talking on their cells. Mm. He didn't come often and he didn't drink much, but he was always interested to know how the palm wine was made, and so on and so forth. It was my job to sell the palm wine, but I wanted to tell him, oh, you should have the palm wine fresh in the village. It is much more sweeter. How could I live in Palm Wine Junction and not drink some palm wine? Where was I? I decided not to ask anyone, but simply let my street sense guide me to, to this nectar, palm wine. I've heard about it all my life. They were selling gin, brandy, and beer in the bar. Who was selling palm wine? I was curious about the status that this palm wine had. It seemed to me that that was the liquid to use for libations rather than hankies, green bottle schnapps. I don't know how the Dutch got in on this, but when the Ghanaian priests started pouring libations, if they didn't have a green bottle of Dutch schnapps, someone would go and get one. Figure that one out. Of course, the most traditional people use palm wine. Mm. After all, which was there first, palm wine or schnapps? Pity. The palm wine sellers never mounted an aggressive advertising campaign. Only one <coughs> palm wine cellar at Palm Wine Junction, located behind the Wachi cellar's kiosk. Wachi is interesting. It's spaghetti and uh, black eyed peas, uh, sometimes maybe an egg on a palm leaf with shita, that hot sauce that you love when we were in Ghana. Yeah. I almost laughed out loud thinking of how. A palm wine cellar in America, located at Palm Wine Junction, would have exploited the situation. I picked the evening, Grace and I wandered across the road to watch evening TV, courtesy of the TV repair man. You had to provide your own seat, but he clicked on the largest TV he was repairing at the moment. I often wondered if any of his customers watched their TV in his front yard. <laughs> I looked into the corner recesses of Palm Wine Cellar's kiosk. 
that seemed to be the place for me. I broke away. Grace smiled graciously. You will not like this palm wine. It is not fresh. I don't care. I got to have it. Mm. Grace smiled louder and waved goodbye. You idiot. <laughs> <laughs> the palm wine saloon was covered by the sky and a bit of tarp. A few slugged out dudes sprawled on the benches or sat over in a corner talking. The situation looked definitely slummy. Is this what palm wine drink is about? Was it some kind of liquid crack? The palm wine cellar was an extremely attractive young woman with a dazzling smile and a high-toned, semi-ingloid accent. Good evening, sir. You will come to help us talk to palm wine? Maybe two tarts. She dipped the palm wine from a large plastic barrel with a wooden dipper. Suddenly it seemed that everyone was staring at me. Why? Hmm. No one ever stared at me when I drank gin, brandy, or beer in the local joints. It was sourish tasting stuff and I could tell from the fourth tart that it would have taken a gallon of it to give me a buzz. <laughs> It was like another kind of aguamiel or pulque. For someone who was accustomed to denser concentrations of alcohol, it was simply a sourish tasting drink. Do you like the palm wine, sir? I told a diplomatic lie. It's not bad. Not bad at all. But I think it's an acquired taste, definitely. To be completely candid about things, I discovered that I enjoyed talking with the proprietor of the establishment a tad more than I enjoyed the effects of the palm wine. Grace also noticed my shift of interest and made it her business to accompany me to the palm wine saloon and introduce herself. I am his wife. Mm -hmm. Well, that put a ceiling on the emotional temperatures that may or may not have been threatening to go higher, but I didn't prevent but it didn't prevent me from enjoying my trip to the palm wine cellar's place. Mercy? How many women in Ghana are named Mercy, hmm. Patience, Charity, Grace, Comfort, Emilia, Rose, Afua? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> Tell me something. Yes, please. How did you come to sell palm wine here at Palm Wine Junction? Oh! Many of the most profound explanations and expressions about the most profound and the mundane are frequently prefaced by Oh! in Ghana. My father and my mother had struggled very hard to save the money uh, for me to go to school in UK and I was able to go there. No scholarship, no help other than my mother and my father. The money coming from the palm wine. You mean they sent you to school and the money they made from selling palm wine? Yes, sir. They were very successful for a time, and they were very supportive of me, but then the business failed and I was forced to leave school. Wasn't it unusual for a Ghanaian family to focus on a girl's education? I felt compelled to ask that after checking out years of blatant male chauvinism. I was the only child. Two others had died before my coming. So there it was, my Palm Wine Junction story. Later on, talking with an elder of the Lobati community, I was informed that Palmyre Junction had a much racier background. During the war, the soldiers who were stationed up the road in Burma Khan wanted to have a tart or two, and there was no place for them. And so here, at this place, it was invented, Palmyre Junction. Early on, that's all they could get, and the girls, of course. But then later came the gin and the brandy and the palm wine had to take a back seat. There are many who do not know about this period in the history of Palm Wine Junction. Palm Wine Junction became for me the metaphor for many feelings, vibes, and grace accompanied me every step of the way. Now I must say this. Uh -huh. We never did any business together, but he made it quite plain that he enjoyed my company. He paid for my beer many times. As we got to know each other better, he asked many questions of me. What do men like to do with you? He asked me. The same thing men like to do with other women, I told him. But, but you are so small, small, he said, smiling. 
I assured him that my woman parts were normal, even though I am less than four feet tall. The young woman that <laughs> he lived with was very sweet, somewhat shy, but very sweet. And she was not jealous of her man. And that was correct. She had no reason to be jealous of him, not at all. He was a beautiful human being, very well-mannered and proper. What I mean is to say is he never made advances of me, despite the fact that he was interested in me and my profession. Mm. Amelia, do you feel that men want you because you make them think of sex with the ch children? Oh, day. My business is prostitution, not psychology. <laughs> I understand prostitution, not psychology. Okay. Emilia, the midget prostitute, is the kind of person who would see you back to school if you had ever spent time there, if you had ever spent time there, or send you to school if you had the courage to go. She had the answers to a lot of questions many of us afraid to ask, have always been afraid to ask. So you are saying that men cannot see me as a woman because I am short, eh? I have to tell you that sex has nothing to do with size. Sex is a thing of the mind. Mm -hmm. You want to buy me another beer? Mm -hmm. <laughs> she said things like that often. I was never quite prepared for what she would say. Pretty little woman, full of pepper and attitudes. Mm -hmm. It wasn't necessary to speak God or treat to know when she was telling some drag ass to pull his shit together. It was there in the way she clamped her fists on her hip, the way she flexed her left leg and twisted her mouth in sarcastic shapes. Mm -hmm. I think I was in love with the little sister for a while, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure it was love or simply lascivious curiosity. <laughs> in any case, nothing mm -hmm. came of it. They used to say, she used to say to me, if Ghana were filled with men like you, I would starve to death. <laughs> the pineapple mm. lady. Mm. I felt compelled to laugh whenever I saw her. Mm. Gorgeous chocolate skinned woman. Mm. Really gorgeous. Everything in the right places except for her two upper front teeth oh, were missing. I have no idea why she didn't have the upper front four, what had happened, any of that. All I know is what I could see and it, it struck my funny bone. Mm -hmm. It had nothing to do with her being poor and fine. The peanut lady up the road was just as fine. Mm -hmm. And also the Kelly Woody lady was. Uh, mm -hmm. But somehow the idea of this gorgeous creature lacking her upper front bordered on the absurd. Or maybe it was simply my vibe at that point in time. Mm -hmm. Oh, some of us thought she was his daughter. How could she be his daughter if he do Brune and she are Shanti? He was, he was not an old-looking man, but mm. it was quite obvious that he was somewhat older than she. Eh? Mm. It was so interesting. Oh, he, the, your Bruni came to live in our compound. He built a nice little house for the two of them with their own bath and toilet. But was not right at all. Not at all. Sometimes they bought my pineapples on credit because they did not have CDs. It was a bit confusing for some people. We discussed it. How could an O'Bruni be poor? <laughs> O'Brunis were rich people. Oh, they had rich grandparents. Grace, his woman, told me he was a writer. Ah. And writers are seldom rich. <laughs> mm -hmm. No matter where they are. I could really understand what she was talking about, about him being a writer who was not rich. Oh, people get rich when they are able to read. And especially when they're able to write, he could do both. Oh. <laughs> I saw the mad couple at least once a day, usually walking to the ocean or away from the ocean. Mm -hmm. A man and a woman, both totally mad. Mm -hmm. That was their outstanding characteristic, madness. Mm -hmm. They were the item of Labati. Mm -hmm. No one could ever recall when they were not an item when they were not together. Mm. Had it not been for the madness they shared, they would probably have been just another 30 ish couple out for a stroll. Mm -hmm. I had moments when I felt guilt for my interest in their lives, but I couldn't help myself. They fascinated me. Mm -hmm. If I saw them across the road going in the opposite direction, for example, I would cross the road and follow them at a distance, oh at a discreet distance. Maybe it wouldn't have mattered if I had walked directly behind them. They were in a world of their own. 
They were both a medium height, about five, 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 six, dark brown skin, dressed in rags. Mm -mm -mm. If dress can be used to describe the layers of filthy stuff they swallowed their bodies in, totally, totally, totally on Ghanaian. The people selling oranges, peanuts, kinky, and other things on the roadside never had to concern themselves with the mad couple's interest in their food. The mad couple ate the, the garbage that they shuffled past. Oh. Shuffle, this is the best description I can think of to describe the way they move from place to place. They were like zombies from mm. another world, another mm. planet. Right. And there was endless speculation about the place they may have come from and what and why they were in Ghana here. I was inclined to buy into the mythical suspicion that they were disoriented ancestors of some negligent family who had not had the proper funeral rites done that they were kind of a super spiritual couple wandering around looking for a solution to a problem they hadn't caused. People were definitely afraid to know too much beyond the obvious about them. They were not Ga, Ashanti, Ebe, Nzema, Adangme, Konkomba, Dagomba, Fulani, Hausa, or anything. They were mad. Mm. They were insane and once upon a time unable to prevent a midnight vision from destabilizing my whole night I decided to take a stroll toward the ocean, feel them, feeling their madness nearby. A bright, gorgeous West African moon. Why don't they advertise that more? Moon over Ghana. Yes. All of the working people are asleep. Mm -hmm. The moon could have been a flashlight or a torch, as the British train Ghanaians called it, uh. gleaming down on the roadside in front of me. Mm -hmm. The shape of the motions directly in front of me caused me to stop. Mm. A gentle, a gentle humping like a giant snail moving forward caught my attention. Mm. The mad couple were making love on the side of the road. Oh, wow. The woman was on top. I felt I was present at an extraordinary event. And despite the fact that they were having sex, I couldn't see anything salacious in what they were doing. What they were doing had the aura of something sacred about it. Why would two insane people make love? Why would they not make love? I was frozen by the sight of these two crazy people being tender to each other. Mm. Gently, quietly, they overshadowed the days we had seen them eating raw chicken torn apart, squawking. Mm -hmm. The days we had frowned watching them defecate and smear the shit on their faces like cosmetic makeup. Mm -hmm. I was frozen in place isolated by a cross-section of emotion. If I turned and walked away, I would disturb him. And yet it seemed so natural that I should be there that I felt no honest compulsion to leave the scene. What they were doing seemed to take a long time. And then there was a beautiful sound like a giant gurgle blending together like a giant baby's burp, the only sound I had ever heard them make. The woman slowly slid off the man's body and they sprawled there, side by side in the moonlight. The man's erection slowly going down with small, throbbing motions. After a few minutes, the erection became a small mound of flat sh flesh between his legs and I began to back away, suddenly afraid for some weird reason. Mm -hmm. My feet scraping on the gravel path moving backwards aroused them. They leaned up on their elbows and stared at me. I will never be able to describe the look in their mad eyes or what it did to me. If nothing else, it made me understand the power of love. In the days and months that followed my discovery, I saw them as often as before, but they seemed to be different people. Somehow I felt that they had revealed how mad love is, no matter how sane the lovers seemed to be, or how mad. And that's where we come to a stop oh at this reading. Part three. Okay. Definitely. Who was it that said love is a many splendid thing? Mm-hmm. Most definitely. Wow. I'm sure you agree. I'm glad you agree. Oh, I most certainly do agree. Let me share your website. It's www.odhawkins.com. And uh, very inspiring and moving.
passage you just shared. So thank you very much. I'm telling you, uh, it's bringing back memories. Okay, yeah. Hope it goes well, for, goes well for sleeping tonight. All right. Oh my goodness. Yes, indeed. You have to look at something uplifting. <laughs> okay. I'll take a sedative. Ah, uh, there you go. And with that, until tomorrow night. Tomorrow night. I'll go on. There's not much more of it, but it is a long, short story. Okay. Uh, and I'm trying to do justice to to the moving parts. Got it. So right. tomorrow is a good time to start around about the same time. Most definitely. Okay. See you then. Well, folks, if you like this in this video, please subscribe. And it. It. Miss. Miss. <laughs>